Good evening, fellow visionaries and everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. We are Visionary Readers Book Club. We have a mission to promote the reading culture within the African continent and beyond, and a vision to see each and every African home with a big shelf. My name is Sibong Senem Golozeli, and I will be your host this evening. Thank you once again for joining us, and let's do hope that we'll have a wonderful time together in this meeting. Today, I am particularly excited because this is our second year of existence. We established this book club exactly two years ago in the month of May, and I'm excited to also announce for the first time in the history of our book club that we have an international guest all the way from the United States of America. But I will introduce her properly when it's her time to speak as our guest speaker. Once again for joining us and without further delays, I am now going to call our first speaker of the evening. We'll be reviewing the book of the month called No More Excuses for Me by Munyara Dongo. The person who will be doing that review for us, her name is Anna Mbubu. She's also an author, but this evening she chose to review the book of the month. All right, ma'am, let's give you about five minutes and then afterwards we will take one question from your review. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Sibo, and good evening, visionary readers. Uh, my name is Anna Mbubu, and today I'm going to review this book. Um, it's called No More Excuses for Me. It's written by Munya Dongo. Beautiful read indeed. It, it's a book that you can read in two days. You can finish it in one day, I must say, or two days. It's so practical. I went through it. It's about 13 steps to stop making excuses and get results in your life. I read this book and I read it again. And uh, in this afternoon, I was just reviewing there and there, and I meditated on the book. So beautiful, great ideas and uh, practical ideas, simple uh, daily life things that we do. And I want to share with you what I read. Um, it's on chapter four. And chapter four, it's uh, about why do we make excuses, the heading itself just made me interested to look at the things that makes us to make excuses. First one, Munya says it's fear. And he is saying, because we've got fear of the unknown, let's face whatever we want to do without fear and accomplish what we want to accomplish. The other excuse that we, we put to ourselves is failure. And he is saying, Failure, it's a lesson that one should learn for, from, graduate, and get to a next level. Failure is not final. The other one is uncertainty. And he is saying, we worry more about the future. And uh, he also uh, talked about how we should rely on God as well, because he knows the future. And we should not worry much about the things that we cannot control. The other one he talked about uh, not, not putting or not setting specific goals. And that makes us to have excuses because we are not putting those specific goals. And the other one he talked about mistakes. Once you have committed a mistake, that might make you to have excuse to do any other activity that you want to do. The other one that also touched me was comparison. He says, let's not compare ourselves with any other person. And the person that you can compare yourself with is yourself. And I want to take you to chapter six. His book is a six chapter book, very beautiful, straight to the point. And chapter six, he, is a, he, he named the chapter why it is important to stop making excuses. The first one is excuses prevent you from reaching your full potential. And I just looked at my life, took some steps back and looked at my life and just asked myself many questions. The other one is excuses hold you back. Um, when you have excuse, you regret. And when you have 
excuse you will settle for less in life. You won't challenge yourself and excuses keeps us from growing. How beautiful it is. My mistake, it's a seven chapter book, not a six chapter. And I'm on chapter seven. Chapter seven is a key. It's the one that he says, these are the steps. The reason why he wrote the book, the steps to stop making excuses. The first one is let's stop comparing ourselves with others. Let's stop fearing the unknown. Let's take responsibility. Let's stop blaming others for the misfortune. Um, let's take actions. Let's take small attainable goals. The other step is let's learn from our mistakes and let's not focus on our weaknesses. We have the power to change and we need to visualize our success. And he says, it's okay. We are not perfect. We are human beings, but we need to work hard and not put any excuse on anything that we want to achieve. He also says it is a habit that can be changed. The excuse is a habit. It's a habit that can be changed. And therefore, he says, remember, your excuses are only valid to you and not to any other person. So do whatever needs to be done to get over your excuses and start living the life of your dreams. I thank you, Dr. Sibo. That's the end of the presentation for Munya's book. Thank you. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you so much, Anna, for that review. As a visionary, I like the statement you mentioned, we need to visualize our success. I think that's a beautiful book by Munya. I loved it so much. Otherwise, thank you so much, Anna, for that beautiful review. Now I'll open the floor to the audience. If anyone has got a question for Anna, right, Wendy Mashilwane, your hand is up. Over to you, ma'am. My question is, as I'm walking back to my room, um, firstly, let me also just comment on the book. I found the book also very, very helpful. I mean, as, as you say, it's a short book to the point, but I think it's very, very impactful. It's a very, very impactful book in the sense that it, it forces you to, to, to look at your life and to actually say, what excuses am I making not to succeed? Um, even if it's one excuse, that one excuse can affect you and you don't see yourself progressing. And uh, Anna, you spoke about the limitations it then places on your life. That's so true. Because if you tell yourself that I can't do something or you've got an excuse, you limit your life, right? And the potential that you have. So yes, I agree. My question is just on how how do you think this links to, um, what is it, the imposter syndrome? Do you think sometimes people feel like I'm an imposter and then they make an excuse not to go ahead? How do you see the two linking to each other? Do you think they do link to each other? An excuse, but also feeling like an imposter or an imposter making an excuse. I don't know. I just I was just thinking about it. Do you see some link there between the two? If not, it's also fine. <laughs> Please clarify the the syndrome to me. It's the um, it's the one where people um, don't believe that they are meant to be where they are. So you always doubt yourself and you be, you ask yourself, but am I really meant to be, I don't know, maybe let's say you are a manager, am I really meant to be here? And then you feel scared that you're going to be caught out. So sometimes I feel that that imposter syndrome, people use it to drive themselves, but sometimes I don't know if it can actually be an excuse not to drive yourself. So I just wanted to know if there's, there's, there's that link and if you had thoughts on it, but it's also fine if you don't have. <laughs> um, Yes, you're very right. Thanks for clarifying that. I think that is an excuse. I think he did mention it, although he used uh, some word where somebody doesn't even believe that I can do this. You can definitely do that. I think that is an excuse. If you're saying I cannot do this, as human beings, we have been given ability to just do anything, anything to maximize our potential. And if you are in that position particularly and feel like... Um, it's like, um, I don't deserve this. You are undermining the power that God gave you. Uh, the Samuel Munya is saying, use the power within you 
to just move out of that uh, situation that makes you not to believe that you can make it. So I think it's an excuse based on the areas that he talked about, also based on the general understanding when, when um, we can't be able to get something and we put um, reasoning on that, it's an excuse, I believe. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Anna, for clarifying or answering that question. Let's hope Wendy is happy with your answer. Ladies and gentlemen, now let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, like I said, speaker number two and three are not currently with us. So according to the program, we'll move to speaker number four. I am excited to tell you that these authors who are going to review this book both of them are teenage girls, and I'm excited to hear what they have to tell us with, with regard to the book they wrote. Their names are Waruna and Una Leruna Tsiane. They will be reviewing their own book for, from classroom to boardroom, starting a business at age 11 and 15 in Africa. Please help me welcome them on stage, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, hello everybody. Um, thank you for allowing us to be on this platform. Um, so we decided to write our book titled From Classroom to Boardroom. And essentially it's all about us, two sisters, starting a book, at, starting a business at age 11 and 15 in Africa. So our book is not only for young entrepreneurs, but it's also a sort of motivation for the youth um, who want to start a business or, or who are already in business, you know, so that they do not feel alone. Because a lot of entrepreneurs, when they start businesses, they feel like as if they're the only ones who are going through struggles. But then we want them to feel that they are not alone, you know. And it's also a guide for parents and adults. Um, first, parents who um, have children who are young entrepreneurs and don't know how to guide or like support them. But it's also for parents and adults who have children who are interested in getting into the whole entrepreneurship space. So I would like to go through the chapters. So basically the first two chapters talk about our perspectives, perspectives in business, um, because we feel like it's important for us to put out our emotions and be truthful and not admit anything because you know, like I mentioned, um, a lot of entrepreneurs do feel a bit lost or lonely. So we do want people to be able to connect to us and relate to us on some level. And then chapter three talks about our launching of business, which talks about how we started at markets and how we started selling, you know, our brand. And then chapter four is the sibling affair, um, both perspectives. Because yes, um, there are pros for us working together, but there are also cons, you know. So as siblings, um, our opinions both matter and we do have different opinions. So it's important to know that there are pros and cons when it comes to us working together. And then from chapter five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, um, it basically talks about how you found out about our business. Um, how we built our business brand, our skills that we've learned, how we built our confidence. Um, and then chapter nine talks about advice for parents of young entrepreneurs and also giving back because we feel like as young entrepreneurs, you know, um, us being able to share our talents and just having these gifts and talents, we do believe we are blessed. So it's important that we give back by teaching other young entrepreneurs or other young children who don't know what they want, how to be an entrepreneur. And yes, then chapter 10 is basically a conclusion in a way, talking, it's just saying that, yes, we're already here on this level, but we're going to go forward if that makes sense. So, yes. So, um, this is the book we're talking about. This is what it looks like. It's called From Classroom to Boardroom, Starting a Business at Age 11 and 15 in Africa. Um, this book isn't just only words, it has some quotes in it, and then it also has um, pictures of the work we've actually done. Um, yes, this book is honestly a short book that can be read very quickly, and it's not a lot to take in as a book. You can get this book on Amazon Kindle. You can also get it on Amazon as a paperback, and through our publisher, MFH Publishers, 
And you can also get it through our mom's WhatsApp number, 069-434-4221. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to review our book and to share what the book is about. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, lovely. Please, ladies and gentlemen, please help me to congratulate these lovely ladies by giving them a big round of applause. If you can unmute and show yourself on videos. Let wow. Me big round of applause. Wow. Congratulations. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well done. Well done, girls. That was beautiful. Very inspiring. So I mean, at this age, you guys speaking with so much confidence and conviction, you even speak business terms, branding. Wow, what a lovely, lovely presentation to hear from. Even the review, I loved every second of it. Maybe from my side, if I can ask, before I ask that question, I commit at this point with everyone in the call that I will be the first in this meeting to purchase that copy. My question then now is, how much are you selling the book for? It's 2.30 um through us and then through our publishers it's 250 but then on kindle it is five dollars and paperback on amazon is nine dollars okay because for me i want a signed copy by both of you i'll order directly from your mom i got her number so thank you okay. so much again guys Thank right. you. Ladies and gentlemen, now I will allow maybe one or two questions from anyone in the floor to ask anything from the girl. Okay, I see two participants' hands are up. So please allow me to, I'll, I see Miracle's hand is up. I'll start with you. Then afterwards, our number will be next. Over to you, Miracle. Thank you, Dr. Sibo. And thank you to the two ladies, Waruna and Una Leruna. I'm very inspired by by your book and the level of confidence that you have. So my question is, how did you build that confidence at this age that you are in to an extent that you are able to write your book and be able to present it so well and be able to sell it? How did you build that confidence? I think um, the most important thing is you have to have support because if we didn't have like the support of our family, our friends, obviously like we wouldn't have been so confident about it and honestly personally I'm not yet that confident so I think it takes practice also you have to practice on becoming better you have to always push yourself for the best yeah great all right thank you for that question miracle okay now let's allow Anna to ask the question okay my doctor is it's it's a compliment to the two girls you've done well you've made us proud i'll buy your book directly from Thank you because i put on your signature the question that i have it's not personally from me my son is here with me <laughs> so he asked where are you from he asked me and i don't know hence i'm asking that question where are you from Joburg. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, great. I think we can leave it from there, ladies and gentlemen. I am super excited to hear there's one person also is curious to get the book. Otherwise, ladies, thank you very much also for blessing us with your presence and telling us more about your book. Right, let me not make this awkward by pausing for too long, ladies and gentlemen. She's already on screen. Her name is Dr. Chris. Mash all the way from the United States of America. I had a privilege of meeting her probably a month or two months ago at the University of Pretoria. That's where she launched her book in South Africa. And she was introduced on stage by our vice chancellor and principal. I think they met at Vets University. It sounded as if they were friends and then it was lovely to listen to your book, Dr. Chris Mash, but I'm sure uh, the audience will also get to learn more about it today. So just briefly, ladies and gentlemen, about her, Dr. Chris Mesh received her PhD from the University of Southern California in 2005. Wow. She was a postdoctoral scholar at Carolina Population Center at the University of North Carolina before joining the faculty of the University of Maryland, which is where she is based now. 
and she has been there or tenured since 2014. Currently, Professor Mesh is writing a book for Cambridge University Press on the wealth, health, and residential choices and dating practices of an emerging Black middle class that is single and living alone. But to die to this evening, I almost said today, but maybe since in America is in the morning currently, we can say today, she will be reviewing her book titled The Love Jones Cohort, Single and Living Alone in the Black Middle Class. Single and Living Alone in the Black Middle Class. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome on stage to review her book, Dr. Chris Mash. Over to you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, it is morning. It's nine o'clock in the morning. I'm in California, Los Angeles, California. So it's early for me, but it is truly a pleasure to be here. And it is truly an honor and a privilege to be behind those two young women that wrote that beautiful book. So I am from, I'm in the U.S., but I'm definitely going to buy two copies of the book as well. So I'm excited to talk about that book in America to, uh, to other young people like, yes, write a book, write books, write books, write books. So I'm going to briefly talk about my book that has actually been published already. It came out in February, and I'm so happy that I was able to come to South Africa and talk about the book. Just for like context, I was in South Africa as a Fulbright scholar in 2017. And so when my book came out, I have friends that are in South Africa. So I had the pleasure and the honor of being able to ha have Tawana Coupe, the vice chancellor, bring me out for Pretoria. I had Dr. Judy Glamini bring me to the University of Witzvatersvan. I did a, a presentation there. And then one of my dear colleagues had me at the University of South Africa. So it is such a pleasure to be back in South Africa, to go back to South Africa and to talk about the book. So I'm going to briefly just tell you a little bit about the book. Um, I want to go on record saying that the book is relatively expensive by South African standards. So it's 30 US dollars. So that's kind of expensive by South African standards. If you are interested in the book, you don't want to pay that kind of price or it is a problem to pay that kind of price let's talk and i can probably get you an e-copy at a much cheaper rate so let's have that conversation and the audio book is actually due to come out in august uh in a couple of months so i'm excited to have an audio book so at the end of the day one of the things i'm trying to do with this book is i'm trying to destigmatize singlehood People often think when you're single, something is wrong with you. you didn't, you're too picky, you're too mean, you're too business oriented, you're too focused. And so I'm just trying to destigmatize singlehood. I want people to be confident, happy, and whole in their singleness, as opposed to being in relationships, relationships simply because they don't want to hold the title of single. And these relationships are toxic, oppressive unfulfilling and sometimes even abusive. And so to prevent people from getting into those relationships or to help people to get out of those relationships, I wrote an entire book about people that are single and living alone. So we can talk about what they are doing, what kind of lifestyles they are actually leading. Because if we spend all the time talking about why aren't you married and why don't you have any children, it again makes these people feel as if there's something wrong with them. I often tell people what's really interesting and I find it so intriguing. People often ask single folks why they're single, but we don't ask married folks why they're married. If we continue to ask single folks why are you single, but we don't ask married folks, we're constantly privileging marriage or thinking that marriage is the only thing that really matters. Now, I want to go on record saying that I am all for Black marriages, I am all for Black love, and I'm all for Black families. However, I'm not going to promote relationships just for the sake of being in relationships because those we could be promoting toxic and abusive relationships, and I'm not doing that. But in America, there's a rise in people that are single and living alone. And so I wanted to find out what their lifestyles are like. What are they doing? I don't want to continue to have a conversation. Why aren't you married? Why don't you have any children? But what are you doing? How do you decide where you're going to live? How do you decide when and where you're going to buy a home? How do you manage on a daily basis being single and living alone where every social institution in America, and I would argue in other countries as well, 
really pushed us to be partnered and be married. So I wanted to really celebrate the lifestyles of people that are single and living alone. And that's really what the book tries to do. It's doing, I think it's doing a pretty good job of it. And sometimes I get, I get a lot of um, pushback and people are saying, well, this is, this is, you're not promoting marriage and you're not promoting relationships. And again, I'm not going to promote those just for the sake of promoting those. I was in South Africa and I was on a radio show. I think it was called Power. I think it was called Power 90.5. I can't remember. And someone had called in and they were like, don't bring those westernized views here. We value family here in South Africa and so on and so forth. And I appreciate being like the American to have this conversation. And the reason why I appreciate it is because in some ways I can say, okay, here's simply what's happening in America. Is the same thing happening in South Africa or is it something different that's happening in South Africa? And when that person called in, it was a really interesting conversation because they were like, no, Dr. Marsh, we really appreciate you for having this conversation because we need to talk about gender-based violence in relationships that are happening in our country as well as in other countries. Other people are like, no, those was westernized views. We don't think about that. So I don't, it doesn't matter where you sit in the conversation, but it really does matter that we have the conversation. And at the end of the day, we understand that being single is not necessarily a bad thing. The other thing, and then I'll, 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 I'll end here, I also, because I am a sociologist and I study social institutions, I'm also making a strong argument that people aren't simply single because they want to be single. And I often say people, it's because of structural forces that have limited people's uh, personal choices. If I were to say it a little differently, I would say racism constrains people's personal choices. If I were to give you an example, if I, Chris Marsh, want to marry another man with a PhD who makes 250 rand a year, owns his own home and has estate planning. They're just not there. So that's racism. And that's that's why we have what we have. So it's so unfortunate when people leave the singlehood conversation at the individual level, because it makes people think who are single that they've done something wrong. But I, as a sociologist, am trying to make more of a structural conversation. So that just gives you a quick snippet of the book. It's a really interesting read. It is highly academic. I appreciate the first reviewer because uh, they said you can read the book in a day or two days. I don't think you're going to get through my book, my book in two days because it's an academic book. But still, and yet, when you read it, I do think you'll learn something from it and you might think about singlehood in a different kind of way. Lovely. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Mesh. I really enjoyed your presentation at the university because you did a slideshow and you even went on in details as a sociologist to make comparison and also as part of the research for your book, you kind of went into these surveys comparing different classes, either race or other age and so forth, middle class, you know, rich and so forth and so forth. Now let's bring back, let me bring back before I allow the rest of the audience to ask questions. I think for me, it's a good thing, you know, if you know what you want, whether you want to live the rest of your life single or whether you want to go into family and stuff and so on and so on, just on your own, have your own beliefs, just look for what you want and what makes you happy. Maybe someone else would ask based on the title, because obviously I can understand sometimes maybe that's why as you shared your experiences with the caller on the in the radio program as to this or maybe Western views, we do have actually in South Africa a serious problem with gender-based violence. So in that sense, at the same time, someone might say, okay, because of that, I could call it even a pandemic because it's a very serious um, something to be frowned upon, something to be frowned upon. Now on your views, if someone is for marriage, but they are truly maybe already entangled to this person, but they are in this situation now whereby on a daily basis, they are abused probably because they don't have their own means of supporting themselves. They are relying on their partner to make a means or to survive basically. Now they're struggling. Maybe they ask you themselves, maybe as an expert to have done your research. I am in this situation. My partner is very abusive. I want to have my own peace. I want to reclaim my own happiness. What do I do in this situation? But remember, I am dependent on this particular partner to make and miss. Probably they even have, you know, 
our children and maybe they've been in marriage for close to 10 years or maybe over five years, depending on how the case may be. Let me not prolong the question. Maybe I hope you got the gist of it. What are your yes. thoughts on that? Yes. So I'm going to answer your question in two ways. The first part of your question is I want to be really clear. I am pro marriage. I think marriage is a wonderful thing if it's done right. Yes. And I appreciate some of my younger students because they're like, Dr. Marsh, thank you for this conversation. My family, my friends have told me, you know, I got to get married. I got to have children, so on and so forth. You've given me another narrative where I have to stand confidently in my singleness before I get into a healthy relationship. I'm all for healthy relationships. I'll promote those all day long, but not unhealthy relationships. To, the, your, to your, exact, your second part of your question, I had a student who was in an abusive relationship and they came to me and I, in America and I found resources. There's resources and there's, um, there's different kinds of organizations and there's houses and places, shelters where women that are being in abusive relationships can go to in America. As a mentor, as someone who finds myself to be a protector over my students, I was like, I don't, that's not my area, but I know how to get you to the right resources that can help you. And you, at the end of the day, they have to have the courage to like want to leave. You can't make them leave. They've got to want to leave. Once they have the courage, find someone, find the resources or find somebody that can help you to get the resources so that you can be able to rebuild and stand on your own two feet and not have to be beholden to someone else for all of your daily needs. Okay, thank you so much. I'm happy with that. Anyone else from the audience who would like to ask a question? I see Miracle's hand is up. Over to you, sir. All right, all right. Uh, I was saying thank you, Dr. Sibo, and thank you, Dr. Chris, more especially for this particular segment. What an interesting book, a very interesting book, because it, it, it holds a different perspective to what we always know. Uh, there's a lot of books on how to be married, how to get into relationships. And here you are coming with how to be single and how to do it successfully. So I have quite a few questions, but I'm going to limit them to how much you are able to answer now. And also just to check if, uh, if these following things are addressed in your book. Okay. First of all is, according to studies as well, I like that your book is academic. According to studies, um, they show that most single women in particular, or most women who choose careers over being settled in marriages over time when they get older they become miserable and they their lives deteriorate so massively so because they find it themselves lonely they have nobody to take care of them and most of them regret their choices that's the first question the second one is um do you see any differences in how men and women deal with singleness and how it affects both of them individually. The third one is you will answer the ones you can answer. You don't have to answer all of them. I just want to check if you have addressed them in the book. And also, do you address how to move from singleness into relationships successfully when one decides to now go into relationships? Because, or are you advocating for singleness as a permanent state? Or is there a time where you do address on how to transition into relationships? And lastly, just an interesting point when you mentioned that racism contributes to the problem how does it really contribute to the problem is the book okay i do understand that your book is looking into the african community the black people but is the singleness different in white people and how does uh, racism really affect that particularly because i don't think i agree with that statement so perhaps you can just clarify for me. Thank you. Oh, gosh. I'm going to try to get through the four quick questions if I possibly can. I'll take the last one and work my way backwards. Um, so yeah. uh, the way I want to answer this is I want to say, like, I don't do interracial comparisons. I don't compare Blacks to whites because when you start doing that, you normalize whiteness. So I don't want to do that. And I'm comparing all Blacks in my book. But to get directly to your point, though, there's a rise in scholarship in America on singlehood. Actually, globally, singlehood is on the rise. But singlehood looks different. So you have a lot of white women in America that are choosing to be single. They're choosing to be single. When we think about it demographically from a sex ratio imbalance, there are more women than there are men. When we start thinking, so I argue that I, I 
I'm glad that you disagree, but I, I am emphatic that racism plays a key role into success of Black women in America. So you have a lot of successful Black women. The data is clear that will have professional degrees and beyond. If they want to marry a Black man with a professional degree, that's they're not there. Part of the reason why they're not there is because of sex ratio imbalance. Part of the reason why they're not there is because of the mass incarceration of Black men in America. Part of the reason why they're not there is because of the killing of Black bodies of Black men in America. Part of the reason why they're not there is they're not accepted in these academic spaces. These academic spaces are anti-Black institutions. And then you add Black masculinity on top of it, it's hard places for Black men to navigate. The numbers just aren't there. That's not simply because that they, they these people don't, these black women that are sexual don't want to get married. The numbers aren't there if you want to marry another black man. And one of the things I'm clear about in my research that I'm not telling black women what they should and should not do. Because there's a whole conversation on whether professional black women should lower their standards and so on and so forth. I will not get in that conversation. But if they have a standard and they want somebody that has a PhD with them or professional degree, so be it. The numbers clearly aren't there. That's racism at its it's institutional racism at its absolute best. I do not advocate for singlehood. There are people in the book who clearly want to be married. And so I'm like, okay, I'm all for you being married and being in relationships. I just want to understand what you are doing as a single person. If it moves into marriage, great, wonderful. But I don't give you like a 10-step guide how you get into a healthy marriage. I would argue one of the ways to get into a healthy marriage is to embrace your singleness first and then think about everything else if you're not happy healthy and whole and you feel incomplete marriage doesn't make you complete marriage doesn't make you whole marriage is not a panacea for all the ills in your life and people often think if i can just get married my life will be better there's no guarantee on that so your third question or it's one of those questions but i think it's really important and this bleeds into your question there was a difference between the men and the women because i interviewed both Men were of the mindset that it's a matter of time when they would get married, and the women were hopeful that they would get married, and the men said it was a matter of time before they chose somebody to marry. And I totally forgot what your first question was, but I think I got to most of them or some of them. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, you did get to most of them. The, the last one, if you still have time to answer, it was the... The studies that show that oh, the, the women. Yes. yes. So I'm the, that's interesting because my I get a I get a slightly different read on the data. In fact, there was a book that was called Happy Singlehood by one of my colleagues, Elia Kim Kislev. And he looked at all racial and ethnic groups. And one of the things that he found is people that were long-term singles who had never been married, never had children, they actually were happier as they age. Part of the reason why they were happier is because you have people that marry to the point I was making earlier. It's like, let me just get married and all my ills are going to go away. They found out when they were returning back to singlehood because of widowed separation or divorce, they didn't have friends and networks to navigate through their older age. So the data is pretty clear on that side. But my read of the data is that people that have never been married long term actually are happier because they build networks. They have friends they can go to church with, friends that they can go out to brunch with, friends that they can go work out with. They build a network. When married people get married, they put all their eggs in the marriage basket. Once they put all their eggs in the marriage basket, and they lose their spouse for whatever reason, they've, they've, been, they've neglected all of their friends. And so one of the arguments I'm making in the book, one of the things that the cohort is consistently telling me is that friends play a central role in how they have successful single lifestyles. So my read on the data is completely and totally different on that. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate yes. that. All right, lovely. Thank you for that miracle and thank you for answering it, Dr. Mesh. I see we also had a hand from Anam Vobu. Anam Vobu, the stage is yours. In place. Hello, Anna, how are you? Fine. Uh, so I came to this call again and again, but uh, um, I had to come. Thank you and compliment for your book. Well done. Um, I wanted to let you know that uh, it's a comment. I do not have a question because I will connect with you privately so that I can be able to access your, your book as well. I love it because it's academic as well. I, I believe in academic as well. So we will talk privately. Yes. But I wanted to inform you that in South Africa, there is a ministry that focuses on single parents only. So it's single, but we've got our children. So I'm the leader of that. I'm the former, uh, I am the founder of Dynamic Mono uh, Single Parents Ministry. So Dynamic, we just called it Mono is your single 
and we are dynamic parents. So we are living with our children. So yeah, we do have that. Uh, we are also not normalizing it. So in the group, I do have single men or single fathers and single mothers. And at the end of the day, I want to connect them. Perhaps there will be some marriages in that. So currently we do have about 40 parents and we meet once a month together with our children. So we do have that uh, uh, group, even in South Africa. Thank you. Uh -huh. That is fantastic. And that dovetails with a radio show that I was on. It airs this week. There was an, another woman on the show and she was like single, uh, single parent, by choice. So these are people that were, they weren't married, but they wanted to have children. And so they decided to have children. And so she was talking about doing some collaborative work. So I would love to work with you. And I would absolutely love to connect, connect you with her as well. Cause now we have it happening in South Africa and we have it happening in America. And it was so refreshing that she was like, you know, she comes from a very religious background. And she knew that the Black church wasn't going to be happy with her choosing to have a child without being married. Um, but she, it's a really great organization, and I'm willing, I want to work with them as much as I can. And a lot of people in my cohort that I interviewed said, Mar I'm not the marrying type, but I want to be a mother or I want to be a father. And they talked about um, freezing their eggs and in vitro fertilization and adoption and all that kind of great stuff. So I touch on some of that in the book. So I definitely want to connect with you once we're off of this call. Please, please, please reach out and connect with me. So I would love to connect you and stay in touch. Thank you. Yes. Lovely. I'll ensure that you two ladies are connected, but yes, thanks you. Thank you so much to everyone who, who joined in the call. Special thanks to you, Dr. Chris, for joining, for making time to join us this evening. Otherwise, we have come to the end of the meeting, ladies and gentlemen. That was the last question. Thank you so much once again for joining us. Till next time, it's finished. Boom. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.